Welcome to Big Pool Discipleship 101, The Bible in a Year, Week 19, 1 Chronicles 18 through 2 Chronicles chapter 12, From Victory to an Evil King. In 1 Chronicles 18, why does it say that the Lord made David victorious wherever he went? Will God do likewise for us? Did David do what was just and right for all his people? In 1 Chronicles 19, what do we learn about the importance of international diplomacy? In 1 Chronicles 20, are there examples of giantism in our lifetimes? In 1 Chronicles 21, how did a census show a lack of faith? Are there other acts which can also show a lack of faith and thus be sin? Does this show that even the most faithful of us can still commit foolish sins? How do the innocent suffer for the foolishness of national leaders? How can a just God kill the innocent? Is he able to give them righteous justice at some future time? In 1 Chronicles 22, was David's providing work for foreigners an act of justice? Why did God not allow him to build the temple? In 1 Chronicles 23, why was counting the Levites not a sin? Was there a different purpose in that count? What does this teach us about how God views an organized church? Why was a national assembly wise to call? What does 1 Chronicles 24 teach us about rotating duties in worship? What does 1 Chronicles 25 teach us about the importance of musicians in a church? What variety of instruments were used? Is it important to rotate musicians too? What does it say about David that he had a seer as an advisor? In 1 Chronicles 26, how important are gatekeepers and treasurers? Did people need help carrying in their offerings? Could gatekeepers include welcomers today? In 1 Chronicles 27, why did army divisions only serve a month at a time? Why did David have so much property that he needed managers? Was some the spoils of war? In 1 Chronicles 28, what instruction did David give Solomon? In 2 Chronicles 1, what was Solomon's request of God? What national issues do we need wisdom for today? Are there really any easy answers? In 2 Chronicles 2, what wisdom do we see in Solomon's preparation for building the temple? Why were foreigners probably the easiest to employ? In 2 Chronicles 3, in what year of his reign did Solomon begin to build? How did craftsmen know what cherubs looked like? In 1 Chronicles 4, how may God look upon our efforts to honor him with beautiful church buildings today? In 2 Chronicles 5, what would we do today if the glorious presence of God filled our church sanctuary and we could not continue the service. In 2 Chronicles 6, what did Solomon do in response to God's glorious presence? What cause and effect relationship did Solomon see between obedience or disobedience and national blessings or cursings? Why do so many discredit this cause and effect relationship today? Is everything cause and effect or are some things time and chance? In 2 Chronicles 7, the praise that He is good for His mercy endures forever is repeated several times in the Psalms. How did God respond to Solomon's prayers? Do God's if-then statements apply to other nations than Israel today? In 2 Chronicles 8, how long did it take Solomon to build the temple? Why were the nations not conquered by Israel conscripted as forced laborers? In 2 Chronicles 9, why was the Queen of Sheba so impressed by Solomon and his kingdom? Though they may not like our religion, are non-Christians oftentimes impressed by our marriages, business ethics, or charity? In 2 Chronicles 10, why did the northern ten tribes revolt against Rehoboam and refuse to be ruled by a descendant of David ever since? In 2 Chronicles 11, what did God say to Rehoboam through Shemaiah, the man of God? How did the northern Levites place serving God above owning their own lands? Would we be willing to abandon property to serve God first? 
in 2 Chronicles 12, what happened when Rehoboam abandoned the law of the Lord? How does this chapter summarize Rehoboam as king? Good or evil? Well, that's it for this time. Until next time, God bless you.